How many of you uh, actually saw the, the Kingdom of Toolmakers uh, that we did one year before, the, the video and the talk that we did on the conference? Because actually this one is a talk we did at this year's conference in The Hague, which was not available on video. So uh, this is nice that it's now available on video if we do it here. And um, actually the whole thing uh, and the whole story that I want to show you and the whole uh, concept that I want to show you is built on, uh, upon the things we did in the Coders Care project. So what I want to give you is previously on Kingdom of Toolmakers. Uh, once upon a time there was a toolmaker. He was a very good toolmaker and his tools were famous all over the world. After a while, he was not able to produce and maintain the tools for all the people, so he gathered many other toolmakers around his workshop. A few years later, he had become the king of a small kingdom of toolmakers, and they all agreed to obey just a few laws on how they wanted to produce their tools and how to enable other people to make use of those. They inspired people to share and were quite successful with it. Someday, a few of the people found out that they could even make a living by just taking the tools they got for free and selling them to others. Those others did not know very much about the kingdom of the toolmakers and the laws its citizens and the king had agreed upon. Since one did not have to pay anything to the toolmakers, anybody could still sell these tools at a reduced rate compared to large tool factories. It was quite easy to earn a living that way, so there were lots of tool shops in the kingdom soon and they were spreading all around the world within no time. After a while, the people who had bought products and tools from the tool shop owners got angry because there was nobody who would have been able to take care of what they actually paid for and because their tools were broken and unusable. And finally, uh, finally the crowd found out that, they, uh, that uh, most of the tool makers were no tool makers anymore at all. They had to get another job for a living, thus making it impossible for many of them to continue. The king himself had resigned a long time ago since he already foreshadowed the sellout of his tools. But then one of the toolmakers came up to his wife with an idea. What if we still gave them our tools for free, but sold our services to those who demand them? The shop owners could focus on the products they are going to create with those tools. Meanwhile, we could provide them with the necessary improvements and maintenance. And his wife added, if we can do that for the tools we created, wouldn't it be nice if we could enable our fellow toolmakers to make a living based on services around their tools too. Yes, this would be really nice, he answered. So maybe it's just not enough to inspire people to share. And finally, this would enable people to share. And this is how we founded the Coders Care project, which is now uh, having several uh, extension maintainers um, combined into a, a larger team, which is available for uh, service level agreements and for maintenance projects and, uh, and upgrades. And due to that project, uh, we are uh, the maintainers of the Localization Manager 2 and of another extension which has been built on top of that because it's not just about maintain maintenance, but maybe just finding out how extensions are working, why there are some drawbacks when you, uh, uh, when you use them. And the Localization Manager is one of those examples. So the story continues. Once upon a time, there was a time machine. It will lead us all the way through the centuries from the early days of the Kingdom of Toolmakers to another era. Small workshops and tool shops have uh, grown into huge factories where many of the skilled toolmakers now work for their owners. The descendants of the famous toolmakers still held the family tradition high. They had two children, sister and brother, who wanted to continue this tradition and become toolmakers as their famous forefathers. So they packed up their gear and took to the road. So they went their separate ways through all the foreign kingdoms and tried their luck in the countless tool factories that had sprung up everywhere during the last centuries. On the way, they got to know many different tool makers, tool factories and tool shops. Each of them had developed his own ways of doing things and they proudly presented them to the young apprentices. Because they had to sell their tools and services to many other kingdoms, the toolmakers had to learn many foreign languages. So they were very happy about our widely traveled apprentices who had already learned many of those. Our two apprentices were already a great help to the toolmakers, yet they often needed the support of specially educated linguists. Each of them provided them with their own tools for the transformation from one language to the other. But when they came to a new toolmaker or had to work with another language, often the tool they had to use for the transformation was completely different. 
Many times they had to start all over again and the effort required to communicate with the specially educated linguists was huge. The larger the tool factory, the more languages it needed and the more specially educated linguists it hired, the more complicated it became to use all the different tools for the transformation from one language to another. Each of the specially educated linguists provided a tool of their own and almost none of them worked together with any other linguist. And of course, each of them kept the tool for themselves instead of providing it for others to work with, just as the famous tool makers did hundreds of years ago. So in the end, the huge number of tools became almost unusable. When our two apprentices returned to the parents' workshop, they soon got into a fight because each of them believed to have found the best solution. The best thing is to have only uh, I'm just uh, a few uh, sentences too far. The best thing is to have only one universal translator with the simplest tools. And I found him, the daughter shouted. Nonsense. The best thing is to have many special translators with different sophisticated tools. And I have found the best of them, the son replied resentfully. While the mother looked at the angry siblings, suddenly an, an idea came to her mind. Quickly, she took the family chronicle, which had been handed down for generations, and leafed through its pages attentively. Then she looked up and asked the father with a proud smile for an old casket, which he had received from his father and which he had received from his father before. Immediately, her father hurried to the attic and soon he returned to the living room with a small dusty box. When they opened the box, there was a magic ring inside with which the ancestors had forged extra honorary tools long time ago. These tools became simple and versatile at the same time and could be modified for different purposes, although they always felt the same to the users. When the magic ring had finished its work, they could work with all translators with just one tool and that's exactly what we're going to show you now. It could be looking like this. But actually, is this, the whole topic is about to enable people to translate. And enabling people to translate in this case means to provide them with an interface, um, which should be more than the thing that you might know already. Maybe you know the localization manager. You see, okay, it, it's a bit better now, the interface, but still it looks more or less like this. So you have some configurations that you have to create, you have fields to put some tables and combinations of tables and UIDs in there and uh, if you're not at least an integrator or a developer you don't actually know what to do with that and it's not that helpful, you can do something with it, it, it is a reliable workhorse under the hood but it's hard to get a grasp and you don't have a real interface. And some of you might remember that uh, we did a talk at the Type of 3 conference, I think three years ago in Munich, where it was about Quo Vadis Type of 3 regarding the multilingual features. And we um, already had some things done, which were actually done on the user experience week. So uh, currently we have just two ways left, which is the connected mode and the free mode. And we um, are yeah, not actually recommending um, the mixed mode anymore. It's still doable, but you should avoid it and you will get error messages if you have that uh, on your page. And we did some prospects uh, about things that might be coming up in the future, but um, as I already said, it was three years ago. So the question might be, uh, what took us so long to get to an actual solution? And this is one of the first problems we had. Actually, this is a slide of another talk we did uh, at the uh, camp in Venlo. The point is um, that there are many providers of translation software, but they don't, do not fully understand the basic ideas of open source in two respects. First thing, many of uh, the uh, translation software providers or services confuse free software with free beer. Still, their solutions are based on Type 3, core, and extensions, such as the localization manager, which depend on contribution of developer time or money. Uh, however, this has not happened too often, so the budget we had was quite low. So we finally started a crowdfunding campaign to share the financial burden between several parties, which worked out a bit better. The second problem is this one. 
And this was the most difficult part actually. Many of those vendors consider it a good idea to combine their solutions with a proprietary licensing model and consider interfaces and connectors as a kind of USP that should never be made publicly available. Did I mention the possible legal side effects that this behavior might have due to the GPL, which also applies to these plugins? You can sell them to your clients, but you are not allowed, for example, to uh, do that based on a license fee, which is completely forbidden by the GPL, but still it is done by some of those providers. Um, nevertheless, the actual USP may, of course, apply to the actual translation solution they offer, but it, it does not apply to Type of 3 interfaces and connectors, and here's why. Many of the editors who will have to work with the interface will have a hard time learning a completely new interface just because their company picked a new or additional translation provider or just because they got a new employer. So the user interface should be standardized and just provide connectors to different vendors under the hood. Otherwise, other uh, users will have a hard time memorizing different behaviors and workflows and this will cost time and money. So in the end, proprietary interfaces might lead to a full replacement of a vendor just because they were not able to provide a very specific language or feature and the deciders wanted to avoid confusion of the users. So they will get, go to the really huge ones which can provide everything out of the box and you just have one interface. And the German translation of USP is Alleinstellungsmerkmal, which also means attribute that makes you stand alone, which is exactly what could happen to your business if you keep your connectors and interfaces a trade secret. The people out there who are already using Type of 3 and at the same time are looking for a translation solution on packages or on the Type of 3 extension repository outnumber the people by far who are just buying your solution because it offers Type of 3 support and they accidentally found it. So there are much many more uh, people actually using Type of 3 and, and in need of translation. And if there would be something they could use in the TR on packages, they would be just using your service automatically because you are the only one who actually provides something. And I don't throw this thing to the floor. Um, so the USP is not the connector plug in itself, but the actual solution connected to Type of 3 with that particular plugin. So we have a two-track solution, again, that will definitely standardize the user interface for each of the editors, having to deal with translations as the first track, while leaving it to the vendors if they want to publish their connectors, too, on the second track. So you can still keep them as a, safe, a trade secret, but the interface will be the standardized one. While it still be highly recommended to have publicly uh, available connectors, due to the reasons I explained before, just one example, we did such a more or less closed source connector, still GPL based, but kept secret by one of the clients. And it was three years ago. And they have about five type of three clients now, which is not that much because there are actually much more people uh, doing translations on type of three. And since we uh, published the localizer, which I'm going to show you now, um, we just had, I think, two or 300 downloads, I don't know exactly, but a few hundred downloads uh, within just a, a very small time frame. And even if just a few percentage of that mm -hmm. amount of people would have bought the, uh, or, or used the other plugin, the interface plugin uh, of that provider, they would have more clients already. It sounds very low. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it sounds very low as a sound level. Okay. Some so maybe the mic is broken? Or it's because it's I it's because it's it's down. It was very low. I think it was, it was too far. Okay. Give it a try and. Yeah. Okay, so actually um, the next one would, would have been the slide on the conference and now I, I will just uh, switch away from the slide because actually you want to see something which is really doing things. And so basically we are talking about this one. Still you have a configuration, um, but you d uh, just have to do that once. So uh, compared to the uh, configuration you already know from the localization manager. It is similar, so you have to create um, some information uh, about um, the language that you are going to use. Uh, is it? Oh, no, it's, it's not here. Yeah. <laughs> I have to put that. 
on that screen. Then it, it is more helpful for you. <laughs> okay, same thing here. Um, is it still working? Because I'm it's, it's still working. Yeah, it's still because working. I'm losing the, the mic here. Um, is, it, is this readable in the back? Or do, uh, should I increase the size a bit? Okay. Okay. Um, so actually what we do is we have the, um, the uh, sorts languages like you are used uh, to in the localization manager if you have used that already. You have target languages that you can select. You don't have to select all the target languages that are available in the system so you can have different configurations for different target languages uh, which is already one of the things I mentioned in the um, information about the um, different translation providers before because in the end the idea is to have um, different providers in this server type um, section. So currently when you just download the localizer you will just find the universal FTP hot folder which is actually working out of the box so you can just use that tell, uh, tell it uh, where the target folders and, uh, are and the incoming and, and outcoming folders, uh, outgoing folders have to be and those will be created um, automatically, uh, provided that you have the, the writing rights uh, on, on the server, of course. But then there will be two folders that you can actually use already without an additional API and uh, additional uh, connection to translation servers. And as soon as you install a plugin, there will be uh, something more. And so you can see it here. Uh, we are currently working on a plugin for translations.com. Uh, which is then providing an API connector to their um, PHP API to uh, get even more information uh, by just um, uh, asking the server, for example, is the translation already done or how many percentage of the translation is done or uh, what about the number of words and the price we have to pay for that if we want to have that in Chinese or whatever. So you get additional information as soon as you have the API plugin, but you can still use it without it out of the box uh, just as it is in the um, uh, TR or packages. Uh, it will test the configuration. This is, these are the two fields up here. So when there was a communication error and something went wrong, it will tell you and it will disable the, um, the configuration so that it cannot be used by the translators anymore. Um, and as soon as everything uh, went uh, fine when you store that um, and the checks went fine, it will be usable. But this has to be configured only once. Uh, you can, for example, define some workflow, which is just a, a label for a certain uh, workflow that will be then used maybe by the translation tool uh, in the backend or in, in that translation tool backend. And you can have project keys to identify that, maybe just for, for verification that you are logging in with an API <coughs> and you have the, the official key to use that project and you paid for it actually. Then we have some um, feature that we are currently working on, which is uh, to have automatic exports uh, based on the same um, uh, interface. Um, um, for example, when you have a news folder and the news folder should be um, sending out um, translation requests once a week because you create a lot of news and in that folder there are always news to translate so you don't have to take care of that. Nobody has to pick them and send them. It will just done, uh, be done automatically under the hood. So you can actually give a time frame here where you say, okay, the news have to be at least that old or maximum that old or whatever. So maybe, um, no, actually it's a maximum. So um, we could have another time frame. Uh, some people said, yeah, maybe we can make it a requirement that the news has to be there for at least uh, one day or maybe uh, a few hours because then you can make sure nobody is still working on that or whatever. So we uh, might pr come up with other solutions there. So that is the configuration and as soon as you have done that there should be something like um, the selector, the card and the settings in here. And we will start with the selector now. I have to make it a bit smaller so that you can see at least all the different colors. Um, we are not working only with colors, uh, but the point is uh, we tried different variants of the interface with icons or uh, different uh, graphical, um, like Matt has described with, uh, with a um, thingy we are doing in the page tree where you have 
um, I don't know the word in English, schraffuren, yeah, so, uh, in, in different angles to make it visible for people with color blindness. Uh, but in the selector, you will have additional information based on tooltips. So it's still available, even if you cannot um, really uh, see the difference between the, the, the colors. So each of the localizer configurations that you created will be selectable here. Uh, we have uh, that one that I showed you was the hot folder test. Um, you can select a card that you created before, or you can, you can create a new one. We will create a new one now. And then you can select from the languages that have been provided by the configuration. Mm -hmm. So you can either say, uh, I want to have each of them or just a few, but in this case, we'll use all of them because then you can actually see how this uh, selector matrix is working. And additionally, you have to uh, select the tables that you actually want to translate. In most of the cases, you want to translate all of them. The list is automatically generated based on records of the page that you're currently on. So you don't have to take care of that. You don't have to configure that before. All translatable tables are here. We can make it configurable that you say, okay, there are some tables that should not never be translated. Um, but in most of the cases, you want to have them on the page and you can select them. So when you toggle uh, all of them, we have, for example, um, file references here and we have carousel items additionally to the page content. The page will always be mandatory because um, the localization manager needs that to group the items together. There's already, um, yeah, is it a bug report or a feature request? Uh, it might be possible within upcoming coming releases to still say, I want to use the page to group the items, but I don't want to send the page information to the translator again, because maybe you already did that. Currently, it is just sending all the page fields together with uh, the rest of the records. In most of the cases, it doesn't matter because uh, the translation tools um, will actually know that they already translated that, use the translation memory and give you back something that you don't have to pay for addition. Um, and sometimes there might even be some changes in the page record that you want to send. So as soon as you did that, you can say store that configuration and it will generate a translation matrix. So um, you can even use a, a time frame here, which is not something we have to do here because it's just a, a few records and you don't have to filter them. But you can still say, I just want to see the records that have changed within the last week or so. Um, and then you can see here is a matrix. And as you can see, there are some languages where, which are actually green, which means this has been translated and nothing has changed after that. And those are yellow which means I did a test before and I sent something already during um, the Type 3 conference. And so this has been sent to, uh, to some translation service. Actually, it has not been because I don't have a connection to that, but I think you can imagine what happened then. So what we do is we have uh, the selector to either uh, select single records within a single language or a whole language at once. And of course, you can do that the other way around and say, okay, I just don't need that in all of the languages, or I just want to add it. Same thing for references. For example, we have a page content here, which contains a carousel item, which contains a file reference. So you can just click on that and you get each of them. Or you can just do it the other way around and say, okay, I just want to have that. Or of course, you can click on that and remove the file reference. And after you did all that stuff and you selected what you want to send to translation, you will store it. And you can go to another page. We are currently on congratulations. Maybe we go to another page with had, has a, at least text and images. We can use the hot folder test. We can use that card, which is now number 64 here. And as you can see, now there is a, another selector here, which has, says uh, select page. So you can switch between the pages that you actually used in that card. And you can use several pages and just put all of them into that card. And as you can see here, for example, we have some records which have been sent to translation, came back, were translated, and now somebody changed something after the translation happened. 
So you will still see that here. And you can do the same thing and just select things however you want them. Store that again. And you didn't see the finalize button because I think it was outside of the um, monitor before. But still, uh, as soon as you selected something and you stored something, you can uh, press the finalize button. And actually, this will then done, uh, do the, the whole export process. So when I press on it, I will get a message because this is really final. You cannot do anything about that card anymore. It will just be finalized and then sent out to the, to the translation service. Depending on the amount of pages and records you uh, put in there, it might take some time because this will do all the exports that you have to do with a single configurations on single pages before and it will create all the necessary files, put them into the hot folders. Um, this takes some time. So we have to at least make sure that there is no uh, option to double click on the finalize button because some people were not patient enough to wait for the result. Um, okay, so now we can go to the card section and maybe go to the congratulations page because we started there. Uh, as you can see, here is a select a user uh, option. When you have different users working on those cards and they created uh, several cards and you have a huge number of uh, cards in your list, um, you want to uh, make it uh, optional to have, so for example, it, in, in my case it's just the admin, but you can have more users here who actually created a card. So you can um, use them uh, to filter the stuff here. And as you can see, you have several cards here. Uh, and there are numbers and colors beside those cards. For example, this one says I have one translation in progress, two translations received, which are, st are still not imported, and one uh, translation imported. And when you open that, you will have the list of all the files that have been created. And you can see the state of all those files and you can do something with, uh, with them. For example, when, uh, when there is the new one which we created here, it would have created four different language exports um, based on the two pages we actually selected. And then you can take a look into the XML file if you want that. In most of the cases, the editors don't want that, but if you're more into tech uh, stuff and you understand what's actually in there, you can use that to check the files if everything went fine and if there's everything you wanted in there. You can just scroll down and see, for example, here are the page groups that I talked about. And you have different elements uh, from TT content and other tables in here, and you can just check that. And as soon as um, the records come back, uh, which is not possible currently because I have no connection to a real translation service, which will actually fill in data to the in folder, um, you have uh, the first click will show you the export file and a, a double click will give you another preview so that you can have uh, two windows side by side with the exported and the translated file. Um, in most of the cases the editors won't use it but it's still useful for, um, for example, when you want to find out why something went wrong. And as soon as some of the uh, translations are received, you can click on this button which is schedule that for import. And after that, they will be scheduled and uh, not visible anymore here to do something with that. And you will have them with the next import step within um, the database and the import will be executed. All of this is done by scheduler jobs. So as you can see, we have the first one, which is just sending files to the translation server. Then we have request translation stages from translation server, which is of obviously not working when you are just working with hot folders. But when there is um, a translation API, which is installed there, you can connect to the server and ask what is ready and whatnot. So you will have different information about that in your cards. Um, you can even reset translation server errors when something went wrong and you want to resend stuff or uh, want to create stuff uh, again. And, um, of course, you can download the files from the translation server as soon as they are ready. And the next step will be to do the import uh, of the translated files into Title 3 
which is actually the same thing you would have done um, as uh, with a localization manager. So what we do is um, we initiate uh, the localization manager under the hood and it will uh, create a command line um, command to do all the stuff with the localization manager and the API stuff of course is based on the several API commands provided by the different translation providers. And additionally, there's a, a scheduled task for the automatic export, which will basically do the same thing that I showed uh, with a selector, but just based on automatically created information. It creates a card, and after that has been done, it will treat the same um, uh, the, the card the same way as it, uh, it is done when you are in the manual mode. So it, it do doesn't make a difference. You can see uh, everything and all the steps and get the same information, but just the export is something you don't have to care about. Basically, that is the current state. I have to go back to the um, to the slides to just go a bit further. What's next? Um, we have published the first official version of the localizer to packages and to the Type 3 extension repository. Since most of the sponsors had to get it for projects that are running on CMS 8, it's currently only available for CMS 8, but we have some sponsors already um, in the pool for um, the crowdfunding to make it avail available for CMS 9, which is a bigger step after it has been made available for that, it will be easier to go for CMS 10. Mm -hmm. The major difference is that we want to uh, get rid of dollar globals type of 3DB and we have, to, uh, we have a lot of very complicated joint queries in there and we have to make sure that this will be working with, uh, with uh, Doctrine and some other improvements uh, will be done as well for CMS 9. Uh, it's, it's not completely filled uh, the part that we have on uh, the Colors Care crowdfunding uh, campaign, but it, it is currently uh, considered by several uh, of the people we are working together with. Um, then we have some of the people who actually did some sponsoring and uh, we, uh, which are already provided as uh, plug-in providers for the localizer. The actual starter of the whole thing was WordBee because uh, most of the stuff uh, which has been done with the interface was actually done for a specific client of them. So it's a translation company which is located in Luxembourg. And they are still providing um, a closed source, not, not closed source, but uh, the, the trade secret uh, plugin uh, for uh, a license fee. But we are trying to explain to them that it might be better to just uh, provide that uh, as open source in the TR. But if you're interested in that, you can um, buy it from them. The other ones, uh, Loptimize is the company that we're working together with, which is actually uh, Daniel Zielinski, and he's one of the inventors of the localization manager. Um, Translations.com is the plugin we are currently working on, which will be available soon. And as far as, uh, as I understood, those guys, they want to make it publicly available for other clients to just increase the amount of people, uh, of type of free people actually using their services. Then we have Supertext, which are currently working on a similar plugin, and on Global Language Marketing, which is currently just providing uh, support for the automatic export to finalize that. It's currently in beta state, but almost working. Uh, B13 uh, with Benny Mark did a lot of uh, things on the localization manager itself to make it available for CMS9. And we are uh, working closer together with them because um, the actual idea is to have that interface in place and then replace some of the, yeah, we, uh, it's very old code in the localization manager which has been mm -hmm. done by Casper and Daniel for uh, I think sometimes even more than 10 years ago. It has not really been refactored because it's a huge monolithic uh, approach and we have to separate that into several methods and make it testable and then refactor that, for example, to replace the, um, the XML, which is currently just Title three stuff, which is not available anywhere else. We want to replace that, for example, with uh, the standards like XLEF uh, or other standards that are used in the translation business. So we don't have to uh, deal with filters to translation tools. 
And the other uh, people who uh, actually just supported uh, parts of the localizer are Bitmotion, Netslabor, and the Jungfraubahn, which are actually providing the project that we are doing to, uh, together with translations.com because those guys have about 50 languages uh, running the website because it's, this is one of the most important uh, trains uh, in Switzerland, which is uh, known worldwide, and they have a huge number of news that they have, they have to translate. So these are the current uh, sponsors. And if you want to support us, that's the motto we are following. Success comes when people act together. Failure tends to happen alone. So if you have questions, you can ask them now. And while you are doing that, I will give you the contact information or the crowdfunding campaign URLs so that you can use that. Questions? Translation services that are um, attached are from manual translations, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, or for example, you mentioned there are translation services like translation.com. Yeah. If you export your data there, it's translated by translators by hand, right? It's a manual translation, or is it uh, like Google Translate API that uh, translates automatically? Uh, do I have to repeat the question? Yes. Yeah, okay, so actually it's about uh, if the translations are done automatically or by hand by those translation providers. Actually, it depends uh, which uh, providers you are using and it depends on the quality you want to get back from those uh, providers and, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, upon the budget. Because in most of the cases, the translation budget you will have to use for a website like uh, Jungfraubahn or um, some other larger um, websites with a huge amount of, uh, of languages, the translation costs are much higher than the actual production cost of the website. Most of the people underestimate that. And um, so if the costs are that high, you want to have parts of the page just translated automatically because you don't care about the, the quality of the text because it's just some additional information which is not very important. But the most important things, maybe um, the product that you are selling or um, the, the most important uh, information about your company or stuff like that, should be translated by real people because they will have better feeling for the language and for localization, which is not just translating word by word, but taking care of cultural backgrounds of the people of the target group. So it depends on what you want, and you can get almost everything from those translation providers because they can give you Deeple or Google Translate, and they can give you a very special high-end translator to have technical translations done from Russian to Chinese or whatever, which is quite expensive, so you will have to deal with that and find out yourself. What I thought is that you can configure multiple providers if you want. Yeah. So the basic idea of this tool is to have several providers within the same interface so that it doesn't change, so the editors can still work the same way and they don't even have to care about that. <coughs> you can just give the, the configurations uh, proper naming, for example, you can say um, configuration one is a translation provider for English, French, and Italian, and configuration two is for uh, Chinese. So you can just pick that, have that in place, send something, and the behavior, and the look and feel, and the interface will always be the same. That's the idea, because most of the things that are currently available for Title III um, by translation providers come with their own interface. And as soon as you have two or three uh, different providers in your system, uh, it's a, a very hard time for the editors who actually have to deal with that. Uh, but this tool just grabs content you have on the page, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like if you have uh, some extension which just uses uh, fluid templates and XLIF files and you the, the text never appears somewhere on the page. It's just the templates behind. Yeah. So, so you are talking about um, not not content, but uh, the language labels that are provided exactly. by extensions. Yeah. For example, because we had that um, yeah. user registration, yeah. things like this. You have just have fluid, fluid templates. You have your XLIF files. It never appears somewhere in the uh, Title III backend. Yeah, currently this is n not happening, but there is an initiative, I think, by Georg Ringer, who is actually working on exactly that uh, point, but uh, I think it's Cloudin or something, <laughs> is the name of the service, 
um, that you can actually translate that on the fly by um, doing this in the back end. And of course it would be interesting if they finished their stuff that we can combine that into one single tool so that you can e easily send out the content plus uh, the generated labels. Mm -hmm. But currently this is work in progress, so I think the initiative has been just founded. I don't know if they're actually already working on something, um, but I think you can find it on the initiative page uh, on title3.com. Um, mm -hmm. So it should be there and uh, available, and uh, I think there should be a Slack channel already. Different use case because here you have dynam dynamic content yep. that is edited by the editors, and then there is static content in the uh, XLIF files, and they are all already cloud providers. You can uh, give them your Git address, so, so access to your Git uh, repository, and then you can configure the XLIF files, and then you will get an interface where everyone uh, can translate the uh, strings that are in there, and it will be uh, synced from the servers back to your Git repository. Also yeah. You, you know, can do yeah. things like that, but I think uh, it's just what, a different what way how you organize it. Yeah. I think the use case is, for example, um, those files might provide context that will be necessary to translate the, the dynamic content, yeah. because you will have labels in there uh, which are just coming from fluid files or from from TypeScript or wherever, and the rest will be then added by uh, by the editor. And if you are missing those files, you don't have the context, and it's a hard time for the for the translator then to get the context right. Because you don't know what this field is for. Yeah. yeah okay, and you don't know how. Uh, well, maybe in a month um, your customer wants something else, so you have to translate almost all of those files. Yeah. Other questions? Because we still have a few minutes left. No questions. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. And hopefully um, you will use that tool, give some feedback, and maybe we can I improve it then to match your needs. Um, actually, this is one of the things we want to reach with a crowdfunding campaign. So if you have companies that might be interested in having an API plugin for that localizer that you're currently working with, um, just tell them. Would be nice. Thank you.